Good morning, church. I'm sorry, did I wake you up or something there? Good morning. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, glad to have you with us today. My name is Ron Otto. I'm the preaching minister here at Lincoln Christian Church, and just uh, it's a good day for you to be with us. I'm in a short series titled, Do You Love Me? Now, let me back up a little bit here. So, uh, I don't know how many of you are dog lovers. How, well, well, let's just ask. Are you a dog lover? Dog lovers in the room, whole bunch of you? All right, good for you. I, I don't hate dogs, all right? I don't want anyone walking out here going, oh, Ron hates dogs. That's not, I just don't want to be shackled to one in my life, all right? When I want to go, I want to go. I don't want to have to worry about who's going to take care of the critter. And so that's my, that's my lifestyle. However, my son out in Colorado has a dog. And so I was out there visiting my son. And uh, I wake up early in the morning. Everybody else is still in bed. But the dog heard me up and the dog's out there. And he's jumping around and he's excited to see me. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. I'm like, how about if you and I go for a walk? All I did was say the word walk. And he was just crazy. And so I grab a leash and hook him up and, you know, let's just go out and around the block. So I'm walking this dog, all right? About that time, coming up on this driveway, there was a woman just standing out there. I don't know what she was doing, but she was just standing out there. She sees us coming. She goes bananas over the dog, all right? I mean, she's just like, oh, look at you. Yeah, look at you. You're so cute. You're so cute. And I was like, is she me? Oh, no, it was the dog. And... Uh, She's just going on and on about the dog. And then next thing I know, she's down on the ground and the dog's jumping on her, licking her face. And I'm like, wow, this is, this is pretty crazy. And then she said, what breed is this dog? Now, I, I have no idea what breed, but I just made something up. I said, oh, he's a, he's a special mix between a Hungarian gray wolf and a German poodle. <laughs> and she's like, I've never heard, oh, it's rare. Yeah, he's, he's really rare. And so I've I, I kind of reached that point where I'm done with the conversation, and I'm like, come on, let's, let's go. And I start, she starts walking with us. So now I'm walking this dog, and I think I'm walking this woman, too, is what I think I'm doing. And uh, she's just going on and on about dogs, and I don't think it was anything about me at all. I, I think she saw me as no threat, uh, as a younger lady, and she just... She's like, I can either outrun this guy or I can beat him to a pulp. So he's no threat. And she just, we're journeying together, journeying together. All right? Now, let me tell you, that whole idea of journeying together, life together, is something that God dreamed up a long time ago. If you've ever, if you're new to the church today or if you're not familiar with this, somebody invited you in. All right, this whole idea of church might seem kind of odd to you at the beginning. But this whole idea that God wanted you and I to spend time together. And this is what makes up the church. The church is not a building. The church is not these four walls. The church is the, it's the people inside. You and I are called the church. It's why I began this morning with good morning church. That's you and that's me. And so I'm in this little series that I've titled, uh, Do You Love Me? And I just started asking myself, well, I love Jesus, and I've been growing my love for him, but if I'm going to grow my love for Jesus, then i got to love what he loves. I want you to hear that clearly. In my desire to love Jesus, then I want to grow in my love for what he loves. And man, does he love the church. There's a commandment of us coming together, by the way. Hebrews chapter 10, we must not quit meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. I, I think that's so funny. Some of us are in the habit of coming, and some are in the habit of not coming, and it becomes a habit. That's interesting. We need to keep on encouraging each other. Uh, this becomes more and more important as you see the day capitalized getting closer. That day capitalized is the second coming is what that's a reference to. So if you're new here today, let me just back up for a moment. Why am I asking do I love Jesus? There's a temptation to fall in love with the stuff. And, and what, if, what if my love for Jesus is just because of all the stuff I get? You know, if I have a love for Jesus, then one day I get heaven and I get eternal life and streets of gold and mansions as the old timers used to sing. And, and I get my loved ones back. I get my loved ones back. What if... What if one of my loved ones is not in heaven? 
will be, will just seeing Jesus be enough? And so I, man, I had that question hung on me and that really started a processing in me. And so I've been trying to make sure that I love Jesus first in my life, that I love him most. Now I love, I love my wife, I love my family, uh, I love you. But somehow in this whole thing, I got to love him first. He's got to be a first priority in my life. And that's not easy. That's not easy when, when I can hug and touch my family, but I can't, I can't always see him. And so it's been quite a challenge for me. And then as I've been going through this, I've been talking to him more. That has certainly helped. I've been reading more about him. That has certainly helped. But today it takes a little bit of a different turn for you. <laughs> Some of you are not going to, this won't be your favorite day, but you'll be okay when it's all done. It's the idea that I love what he loves, and he loves the church. Man, the church has been under attack from the very beginning, by the way, from the very beginning. You know, the church, oh, church is boring, church is irrelevant, church is intolerant, church is full of hypocrites. That, that one always makes me laugh, by the way. I don't go to church because it's full of hypocrites. Well, so is the grocery store. <laughs> you go there, you know, football stadiums, politics is full of hypocrites, you know, you're all part of that. But somehow, you know, you don't want to go where there's, where there's hypocrites. Yeah, we believe in living a good moral life, but we've all failed. We're not perfect. And so if that makes us hypocrites, I suppose it does. But we're trying, we're striving, we want better. I don't go to church because it's always asking for money. <laughs> so do teenagers. You don't stop going home to them, do you? You know, this attack has been from the very beginning. Jesus said, Jesus said, by the way, uh, the attack, that if church was his idea, then when you get caught up in the attacks on, on, on the church, that does not come from God. None of those things I just said as criticisms come from God. Well, then where do they come from? Jesus made this statement in Matthew 16, On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overpower it. Oh, boy. Where do the attacks on the church come from? <laughs> yeah, hell. Now, is the church perfect? Not even close. This has been a part of my uh, entire life. Uh, I've put my whole life, my adult life, into serving a church. Um, Church isn't perfect. You know, there's some days here, by the way, that the church is the closest thing to heaven we have on earth. And then some days it's not. <laughs> and you just got to accept that. But inside all of this, God is not ready to give up on the church. And I don't think you and I should give up on the church. And so in my love for what Jesus loves, I ask myself, okay, he loves the church. Why do I need to love the church? Why, why do I need to? I've got a top four for me. Today, you may come up with a different list. That's great for you. But as to why I need to love the church, I'm going to give you a top four. And this is going to be a countdown just like David Letterman. You ready? All right, real quick. It moves fast. Number four is this. Because the world is a better place because of the church. Do you know how many clinics have been started by churches? Do you know how many hospitals, how many children's homes, how many feeding centers, how many disaster relief? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on and on and on of things that the church has created that has made this world a better place. You listen to some people talk about church history, and there have been a few moments in church history that were kind of dark. I understand that. But in their mind, the, the world is not a better place, and the world is absolutely a better place. Third world countries where missionaries have gone in and started schools and hospitals. Uh, and a church, but they've done it all with very little money. We send, uh, we send relief money through Harvest of Talents. We try to help people in disasters and hungry people, starving people all over the world. You know what? Forgive me if this sounds a little harsh, but I don't see that many atheistic groups doing that. And here's the church, and the church has done this kind of service. I believe the world is a better place because of the church, and I love it for that. Number three, because it's a moral compass in our community. I think we're part of the conscience of our community. I think there's times when a church needs to stand up and say, listen, we love you so much, but, but this lifestyle is not acceptable. Whew. 
That's not easy. I have gay friends that I love dearly. I enjoy spending time with them. I have gay family members, and I love them so much, I haven't stopped spending time with them. But if you're asking, can we become a church that applauds those lifestyles, we can't. I know there are several denominations out there that have decided to be uh, accepting of that in order to be more welcoming, in order to be more relevant. I think they're shallow. I think they have gotten off track from what God's Word says. If, if I'm saying something that you're like, man, I would really like to have more conversation with this guy about this, I'm willing to do that. I don't care. I mean, it doesn't matter. I'm not trying to hurt anyone's feelings in here, and I'm certainly not trying to come off as ugly. But when, when you start talking about a moral standard, it, it can come across, it can be a little unattractive for some churches, and yet you, you can bend a reed so far that it snaps, and that's not healthy. And so for us here at the church, our leadership and our staff, we've all been in agreement. We've read through the scriptures. We've studied it in depth. And this is not something we can be a blessing to. We can still love. Uh, you're welcomed here. If, you, if you're struggling with your lifestyle, and you wanna, you're more than welcome here. We will love you, and we will... Uh, be a part of your family, but if you're asking us to applaud, applaud a, a gay lifestyle, I can't do that. See, I, I'm challenged when, when I call myself a Christian, it means I accept the authority of God's word. If you call yourself a Christian and you do not accept the authority of God's word, then I think you're playing games a little bit. And I think the church needs to be this stronger voice uh, when so many churches are not Sorry if that came off dark, but here we go. The second reason I love the church is because we're proclaimers of the resurrection, and I love this. The church was not built on a book, by the way. The church did not give birth to the resurrection. It was the resurrection that gave birth to the church. The church took off in such a powerful way, and it took off so fast and so uh, quick in its time, and it was all because of one thing, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, the disciples, when they started teaching about, hey, there really is a resurrection and there really is eternal life, if they would not have had an empty tomb behind them, this whole thing would have failed. If they would not have had eyewitnesses who said, uh, I saw Jesus alive. I saw him. I talked with him. I walked with him. I ate with him. If the disciples in that early days would not have had the proof of the resurrection, the church would have never made it. Just teaching and saying, hey, I believe in the resurrection would not have been enough. They had the evidence behind them. Their entire community knew that the tomb was empty. You and I, when we are part of a church, we become proclaimers of the resurrection to little children, to teenagers, to adults. We become proclaimers of that because it's in the resurrection that people find the most hope. One day, one day, you are resurrected. One day you do get eternal life. Christ triumphed over death and hell. And you want to know why that's relevant? That's relevant because that's what you and I have to do. We have to triumph over death. And we have to triumph over the hell of this world. And in order to do that, we connect ourselves to Jesus. We find ourselves under the authority of his scripture. And therefore, we teach and believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you're sitting there today going, I'm not even sure I know what all the evidences are. I'll, I'll take you through that. Just got to sit down and be brave enough to meet with me and we'll talk about all those evidences, but they're numerous. All right, there's four, three, and two. Here's the number one reason why I love the church. Number one is because it is the bride of Christ. I love doing weddings. Uh, I love seeing the bride come down. Anytime I see a bride, it carries my, my heart to this imagery over and over again through Scripture. So many of them. I'll show you a few in a moment. But so many passages where, where the church, you and I are called the bride. You know, to the men in the room for just a minute, there's so much 
masculinity in scripture. There's so many masculine characters. And when we cover those masculine characters, I ask the women to push themselves to grow from that masculine illustration. But here, when we're talking about the church, God chose a very feminine illustration. And gentlemen, you and I, we, we have to embrace this, that you and I, we're, we're the bride of Christ. And it's a beautiful imagery, by the way. He's a perfect gentleman. He's, he is, the, the bride is the heartthrob of this groom. He has abandoned love for her, and even to the point he'll sacrifice his own life. And the imagery of this is really quite beautiful, and I'm, I'm a part of the bride of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. I love weddings. That imagery is, by the way, just recently, Jennifer would tell you who's serving it, she came to my office. She said, you're not going to believe this. There's a guy on the phone. Uh, he wants a scuba diving wedding. And I said, all right, I'm curious. And so I paid, I'm talking to this guy. He's from down in southern Illinois. And uh, he said, literally, he said, this is all I did. He said, I punched in three words in, uh, on, in Google. He said, I punched in uh, Illinois pastor scuba. And he said, yours was the first name that came up. And so, sure enough, you know, he read my church bio and stuff, and I mentioned in there that I'm an advanced scuba diver and stuff. And, and so I'm like, you got, what are you going to do? And he goes, we're going to be underwater, and you're going to marry us. And I'm like, I don't know. I said, I, this, this sounds a little, how are we going to pull this off? Are you going to do it with signs? You know, so we'd be down there looking at each other, blowing bones, you know, and I hope I've signed, do you take her? And <laughs> he'll be like, I do. And, you know, it just seems so weird. And, and then I said, what are you going to do when I say you can kiss the bride? He said, we're going to take out our regulators and I'm going to kiss her. And he goes, she's brand new to scuba diving. She's freaked out. Oh, really? Let's take a brand new scuba diver and then take out the breathing apparatus, you know. Oh, this. I told him, I said, you know what? <laughs> I'm really not feeling this down deep. Yeah, you're right. That's bad. I told, I called my sons afterwards, and uh, I said, you're not going to believe, and my sons dive with me, too, and they're like, do it. Just do it. We'll be the photographer. We'll be the ring bearer. You know, they're totally in, and I have this image. I have this image of this bride. I can't get out of my head. She's not perfect. But the bridegroom is perfect. When, when God was looking for an illustration of how we husbands should love our wives, when God was looking, do you know he went to this groom and bride illustration? Ephesians chapter 5, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and he gave himself up for her. That became an illustration. Isaiah 62, as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will the Lord rejoice over you. And then 2 Corinthians have we not been set apart as a pure bride to one husband, to Christ? By the way, when you get to the end of the book of Revelation, I know there's all this judgment and there's this gloom and there's the you know, uh, Armageddon and battles and there's hell and brimstone. There's all that stuff. But right after all of that, do you know what the next big image is? It's an image of a wedding and not just a wedding, but the wedding. The wedding between Christ and his church. Revelation 19. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come. And his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. This is an image, by the way, of a king. Of a king who comes back in, into battle to fight for his bride. That's the imagery there. And when you ask me why I love the church, I love the church because she is the bride of Jesus Christ. Oh, be careful what you say about his bride, by the way. Oh, Jesus, we love you. We love you. You're awesome. But your bride, oh, yeah. We rejected her. Hmm. If you did, if you'd have tried to pull that off at my wedding... I would have asked you to leave. Accepting me is accepting my bride. And then the way some people mistreat the bride is 
It's really disappointing. So just in your imagination for a moment, you're at a wedding. It's a big wedding. The room is packed. The door off to the side opens, and in comes the groom. Oh, man, he's smiling. He's got a smile so big on his face. looks like it's about to break. He couldn't be more excited for his wedding day. He walks over and stands down front. He's dressed all in white, and white teeth, and dark skin, dark hair, dark eyes. And he is standing there just beaming, waiting for his bride to come down the aisle. Music starts. Doors in the open, back swing open. Everybody stands. They turn around for their first glimpse of the bride, and they gasp in horror. She, her dress is torn. Her flowers are wilted. She's got a black eye, a fat lip, a bleeding nose. And it's obvious to everyone, oh, man, someone has mistreated the bride. And then they're looking at this. They're looking at this beat-up, bruised bride. She's not perfect. He's perfect. He deserves better than this. Oh, my goodness. How can this even be? Ha and then in the surprise of everyone, this groom doesn't lose his smile. He walks all the way down that center aisle. He grabs that bride's arm, puts it in his, and he takes her back down front, smiling all the way. And he marries that bruised and mistreated bride. That's the image of the church in Jesus. A lot, of, a lot of times the church will take a sucker punch from somebody who doesn't know what they're doing. You and I are part of the church. and I love you. And I love what goes on here question is, do you? Do you see this as relevant or not? <laughs> it's relevant. Saving lives, saving lost souls, seeing more people in heaven, it's relevant and it's important. And so as I'm trying to turn up the thermostat of my love for Jesus, I also turn up the thermostat of loving what he loves. And he loves you. The greatest most tender message in scripture is that when Jesus looks at you, he sees you as his bride and you are the heartthrob of this groom.